Hello everyone, welcome. We'll get started momentarily. Welcome everybody. We're just giving a chance for everybody to join. Just giving it another moment as people are still coming in. All right, thank you everybody for coming. Um, hello everyone. And on behalf of uh, the Oxford Migration Study Society, welcome to the annual conference. I'm Bella, one of the co-presidents of OMSS along with Sarah, who you will hear from shortly. Um, we had a wonderfully engaging start to the conference earlier today, but if you missed it, not to worry, it will be available on the Border Criminology's YouTube channel in due time. And we are very excited to welcome you to our keynote by Harsha Walia. Before we get into it, I just want to take a moment to briefly flag some logistics. Please feel free to type questions into the Q&A box rather than the chat box as you think of them. And you will also have the choice to, or the chance to upvote and comment on each other's questions. Welcome everyone, my name is Sarah and together with Bella, I'm this year's president of the Oxford Migration Studies Society. And we're both really excited here to welcome you to the second event of the annual Oxford Migration Conference. Uh, the keynote speech with Harsha Lamia. And for some of you, I can probably say welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us also some hours ago. And first of all, I would like to introduce Trin, our colleague and social media manager, who will be moderating tonight's event with Harsha Lamia. 
Chen is currently pursuing an MSc in Refugee and Forced Migration Studies at the University of Oxford, where she researches theories of citizenship, refugee resettlement, and refugeehood. She has worked to resettle refugees, to bail immigrants out of detention, and to organize sanctuary movements. Chen resettled in Utica, New York, from Vietnam at the age of three. She holds a BA in Political Science from Yale University and a Certificate in Human Rights Studies from Yale Law School. And I will let take Trent from here. Enjoy. Hey everyone, welcome to our conference. Um, we're really thrilled to have Harsha here with us and I am going to briefly introduce her for before she gets into her keynote address. Um, Harsha Walia is the author of Border and Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism and the Rise of Racist Nationalism. It's this book. Uh, I It's a really fantastic book that delves into a lot of issues all over the globe and I think that everyone can get something out of this. So I highly encourage everyone to go get it. Um, she's also the award-winning author of Undoing Border Imperialism um, and co-author of Never Home, Legislating Discrimination in Canadian Immigration and also a co-author of Red Woman Rising, Indigenous Women Survivors and Vancouver's Downtown East Side. Um, Harsha has organized in grassroots migrant justice, anti-capitalist, feminist, abolitionist and anti-imperialist movements for nearly two, for over two decades. Trained in the law, she is the past project coordinator of the Downtown Eastside Women's Center and currently the executive director of the BC Civil Liberties Association. Um, we are really lucky to have her with us today for what I know will be an inspiring keynote address that's really gonna set the tone for the rest of this conference. And we'll definitely encourage everyone to think more radically about how we see the world and how we can remake it um, to be more equitable and inclusive for all. Um, so without further ado, um, Harsha, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And thank you so much to everyone for having me. Uh, it's really an, an honor to be here alongside all of you. And congratulations to all of the organizers for organizing this incredible uh, conference. Um, give me one second. I'm having some <laughs> issues with my tech. So please uh, bear with me for 30 seconds. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, just lost some files. My apologies. Okay, here we go. I think I figured it out. Um, so thank you again. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging that I'm here on unceded Coast Salish territories. The lands that I'm on are the lands of the Musqueam, the Suela Tooth, and the Squahomish Nations. And for people watching in um, who aren't familiar with the, the practice of acknowledging territories, uh, it's really to acknowledge that here in North America, uh, land continues to be held under Indigenous jurisdiction, right, that settler colonial states like Canada and the United States have really formed on top of Indigenous nations and Indigenous sovereignty and Indigenous jurisdiction. Uh, so where I'm located is Vancouver, uh, or colonially known as Vancouver, but really is, as I said, land that continues to be held by Indigenous nations, by Coast Salish nations, who are the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squahomish. Um, I also want to uh, today really just affirm, given everything that's going on around the world, uh, solidarity with Palestine um, and Black-led rebellions around the world. And in thinking through about bordering practices and border formations, uh, I think, you know, those are not acknowledgements that are token, right? If we're to think about bordering practices and how borders enact violence, it's fundamentally connected to the liberation of Indigenous peoples, including Palestine, around the world. Uh, and Black-led decolonial and abolition movements. And I'm hoping part of what my talk does uh, is kind of weave together some of these movements that we often see as disconnected from migrant justice organizing and to see the deep connections uh, between these, these struggles for liberation. Um, I want to preface my talk with a few uh, preliminary points, which is to say that my scholarship on borders, thank you so much uh, for introducing some of my work and my books. Uh, but really emerges, that scholarship emerges from personal histories uh, and also from movement struggle. Um, and that for me is important uh, because I think, you know, sometimes people like myself who are given a platform to speak are often kind of held up uh, as individuals. But I really want to be clear that these ideas are not solely my own. I trace a lineage of revolutionary scholarship and importantly of movement organizing and oral histories, that there is no liberation in isolation. 
Um, and I also want to say that I don't intend to focus on one particular aspect of the border or one geography, but really to explain in a broad sense uh, the interconnections between border violence and globalized racial state violence and racial capitalism, which is also, of course, also always completely gendered, sexualized, transphobic, ableist, and more. And in doing so, I really want to refuse methodological nationalism and draw promiscuously from transnational bordering practices. And I think in order for our struggles against borders to truly, meaningfully, genuinely be anti-border, they actually have to be internationalist, right? Which means that we need to be understanding what's happening around the world. Um, and I also take as my spark starting point that we need to abolish borders. Um, so everything that I'm gonna say starts from that starting point that we need a world without borders. And I wanna start with the invocation and frame my talk in the words of the late great Eduardo Galeano and Eduardo Galeano in an interview said, quote, that the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. The world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. And so that for me uh, is the premise, the premise of my talk is how do we create a world, right? What is the work that we need to do in order to create a world that is a home for everyone? Um, so I'm gonna offer up a few invocations in the context of this talk. Um, my apologies if they're if they're fast and rapid fire, but again, I'm hoping to, to create something that is that is interconnected and weaves together um, some different ideas. So the first is that in order for borders to be anti-migrant and anti-refugee, as we know that they are, uh, the order the border is also inherently anti-black and anti-indigenous. And again, I say this because oftentimes globally, indigenous, decolonial, and black abolition struggles are often seen as disconnected from the immigrant rights movement, except perhaps in identifying shared struggles against racism. However, I want to argue, as many others have before me, that the war on migrants does not exist separate from or simply parallel to anti-Indigenous and anti-Black violence. And here I want to offer the example briefly of the United States and the US-Mexico border. And if we look at the early bordering practices of the US-Mexico border and the formation of the US-Mexico border, in fact, it's impossible to talk about the US-Mexico border without looking at the ways in which the formation of that border was completely bound up as a central method of eliminating indigenous peoples and controlling black people. And so I would argue that US border imperialism is completely structurally bound up in anti-black and anti-indigenous genocide. So the ways in which we can see that is that you know, the US annexation of the Republic of Texas as a slave state in 1845 was followed by a full-blown US military invasion of Mexico and debt manipulation by the US president at that time, James Polk, which resulted in the forced annexation of half of Mexico through the imposition of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. So this treaty of 1848 forced Mexico to drop any claims to Texas and also authorized the United States to capture land comprising all or part of present day Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. In total, the US seized more than 525,000 square miles of territory in Mexico, essentially shifting the border south. What this meant is that indigenous lands were seized, right? So indigenous nations, sovereign nations, including the Comanche, the Apache, the Seri, the Kiowa were all forcibly assimilated into the US nation state. And some of the earliest battles in the United States against deportation were not those of, you know, whom we might consider to be migrants and refugees, right? So a lot of times some of the earliest battles um, that we point to are, for example, of Chinese exclusion. But some of the earliest battles against deportation in the United States were actually those of indigenous Crees and Chippewas from the nation state then of Canada, and the Yaquis from Mexico who crossed into the United States in the late 19th century, mid to late 19th century, and launched political battles for federal tribal recognition to challenge the US state's subjugation of them as foreigners and deportable illegal immigrants. So these were some of the first large scale fights against deportation in the United States. And again, you know, that's often not part of the mainstream narrative of how we understand exclusionary immigration history. And today we continue to see the impact of the US-Mexico border on indigenous peoples in a number of ways. First is of course the continued forcible assimilation of distinct indigenous nations into the rhetoric and legal fold of quote unquote US citizenship. 
which tries to produce indigenous people as domesticated citizens of the US, right? So again, obliterating indigenous jurisdiction and presence. Uh, second is we continue to see the impact of border militarization on indigenous communities. So for example, the Tohono O'odham are an indigenous nation whose land and nation are completely split up by the US-Mexico border as a result of the 1853 Gadsden Purchase. And so 62 miles of the US-Mexico border runs through Tohono O'odham lands and an army of US border agents patrol the reservations. And the US Customs and Border Protection has contracted Israel's largest private arms company, Elbit Systems, to construct a number of surveillance towers on Tohono O'odham. And this community is now actually one of the most militarized communities in the United States in order to um, perfect and enact border militarization. The third way in which we can see the particular impact of the border as inherently anti-Indigenous is that a large proportion of Central American migrants and a growing number of Mexican migrants to the United States are Indigenous peoples, right? So oftentimes, Indigenous peoples from Mexico and Central America get subsumed into a kind of pan-Latinx identity, which erases the reality and capture uh, of Mexico and Central American nation states. It erases the colonization of Central America and Mexico by the Spanish. And it ignores the ways in which the imposition of borders throughout uh, North America and Central America has criminalized, again, indigenous nations. So Jacqueline McKean and Claudia Patricia Gomez, for example, were two Maya girls, both of whom died and were killed by US patrol agents, US border patrol agents in 2018. But their deaths were often reported as the deaths of, uh, you know, of Latina, of Latina girls. And their communities have really kind of pushed back against that and said, no, we need to be specific, right? These are indigenous Maya women and girls who are killed by US border patrol. Um, and so I think it's important to understand again, the ways in which, uh, which anti-indigenous politics and indigenous genocide is central to border formation. And we see that even though I'm giving examples of the US-Mexico border, um, there are many contexts in which we can see how this travels, right? Including for example, in the European context, uh, and the imposition of border policies and its impact um, within Europe on indigenous communities, on Sami communities, on traveler communities, and more. Moving now to anti-Blackness, I want to quote the words of Ronaldo Walcott and Idil Abdullahi, who emphasize and teach us that the entire politics of migration is embedded in anti-Black racial logics. And they say, quote, Movements that we now call migration are founded in anti-Blackness, taking their logic from transatlantic slavery, end quote. And indeed, again here focusing on the US briefly, the architecture of US border controls completely derives from anti-Black technologies regulating mobility. And shortly after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that I mentioned of 1848, uh, we saw the imposition or the US imposed the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. And what the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act did is it allowed slaveholders to kidnap and capture black people that they claimed had escaped to the professed free states. And slave catchers and authorities would kidnap and transport black people across state borders. And after the annexation of Texas, slave owners also started to form militias to patrol the US-Mexico border to prevent black people from escaping to Mexico. So again, here we see that one of the, the technologies of border controls was not only to exclude or keep migrants and refugees out, but it was to prevent black people from escaping to Mexico. And these border militias, these early border militias swelled their, length, their ranks from slave patrols and would conduct cross-border raids in the South, in the Southern region of the US uh, into Mexico in the quest to capture black people. And I think this is vital to understand for a number of reasons. First, it highlights how police in North America originate in slave patrols, and also that border enforcement uh, really takes its origins in slave patrols, right? Second is the fact that these early bordering practices, again, to emphasize, were to control and contain Black people within the nation state. So I think what this really, um, suggests to us is how important it is to understand, and one of the arguments that I make in Border and Rule is that the border is less about a politics of exclusion per se, although of course it, it includes that, but I would argue that it exceeds a politics of, ex 
exclusion and is better understood as a key method of imperial state formation, hierarchical social ordering, and also of labor control. The third reason that I think tracing these histories is important is because as Robin Maynard argues, black feminist scholar and activist and organizer uh, uh, is Robin Maynard. She argues that quote, the global positioning of black life as enslavable has placed black migrants in a structural position that differs from other migrants of color, end quote. And we see this today in the framing of the black Mediterranean in Europe, right? And how important it is to look at the formation of the Black Mediterranean as an extension of Paul Gilroy's, the great Paul Gilroy's work around the Black Atlantic. And the Black Mediterranean locates the murderous European border policies in the material relations and roots of anti-Blackness. The Gillette Noir, the Black Vest as they're anglicized in France, is the largest collective on, of undocumented migrants in France and they assert their presence as an accounting for the ongoing colonization and exploitation and anti-Blackness that is a precondition for the very existence of Europe. They boldly pronounce, quote, we are the freedom to move, to settle down, to act. We will take it as our right in the name of all those who did not make it here and to save ourselves and for all those who want to make it out here, end quote. And so again, I think this is uh, an incredibly important history because the violent transformation of indigenous land and black people into racial property has sanctioned global white citizenship. Meanwhile, racialized migration continues to be scrutinized and controlled. And police, prisons, and borders all operate by mobilizing the people who are caught in their crosshairs. And notably, the word mob, the word mob, which we know is a criminalizing vocabulary used to link large groups of poor racialized people to social disorder in inner cities and at the border derives from the word immobility, right? So we see that carceral regimes operate through a logic of immobilization. Angela Davis and Gina Dent write, quote, we continue to find the prison is itself a border, end quote. Drawing on Angela Davis and Gina Dent, we can say that the prison is a border and the border is a prison. So the border is at once domestic and global. In a world without police, prisons, private property, militaries, and borders is a necessarily interconnected abolitionist and decolonial horizon of freedom. The second intervention that I want to offer is that borders maintain global apartheid, right? That we can't think about borders only in a domesticated framework. Um, and part of my uh, reasons really for writing Undoing Border Imperialism and Border and Rule was to really work against the tendencies in mainstream immigrant rights movements and a lot of uh, immigration scholarship um, is that it really emphasizes these domesticated liberal frameworks where even, you know, the kind of most often left, left pole um, of immigrant rights work still really reproduces a politics of liberalism, a politics of charity, uh, and one that really emphasizes um, a domestic framework, right? It becomes about quotas. How many more immigrants and refugees can we take? It's a liberal framing of refugees welcome, where it con which continues to center a politics of hospitality uh, rather than a politics of justice. And I think one of the most profound yet simple framings um, is the, the framework of quote, we are here because you are there. This is a very common slogan in more radical migrant movements and refugee movements. We are here because you are there. And I think this is such a, a necessary challenge that links up the global politics of borders, right? Which is that we can't simply talk about migrants and refugees without talking about the global practices of extraction, of climate change, of war, of imperialism, of free trade agreements, of drone warfare. We can't talk about these historic and ongoing um, forms of state and racial and imperial violence uh, if we are going to talk about borders. We can't ignore these forms of violence. And so I think this is important because, you know, as we are faced with the rise of the right 
and the kind of really escalated white supremacist ideas, um, which are overtly white supremacist, right, um, in their anti-refugee, anti-migrant, anti-Muslim xenophobia. Uh, we can't counter those with more liberal kind of responses, like, you know, we need immigrants, or we're all immigrants, or refugees welcome. Because again, these kinds of more liberal framings ignore the foundational violence of what even creates migration. These migrations that we conceive of as coming from over there, wherever over there is, um, are, they are inextricable from the policies of our governments, where our governments are you know, Western governments, right? So whether that's backing dirty wars, uh, being complicit in the war trade, uh, being complicit in the arms trade, being complicit in um, you know, the violences of extraction, of mineral extraction, of land grabbing, all of these mean that we are bound up. We are fundamentally bound up in the crisis of displacement and immobility that the world is facing. And so for me, that's why a framing like border imperialism um, is more useful because it ties us up not only to look at borders from a nationalist framework, but to understand how central borders are in the production and maintenance of imperialism today. And as we know, the vast majority of people are not actually migrating, right? The migration crisis suggests, the framing of the migration crisis suggests that people are actually on the move. When we know that the vast majority of people are actually immobilized, right? That border controls um, and many other structural barriers make it such that the vast majority of people continue to be immobilized in their home countries or at best, um, are in neighboring countries. And so I think it's really important to really question language like refugee crisis, like migrant crisis, um, and how that's become a pretext for shoring up further border securitization. And I think what's particularly insidious about representations like the migrant crisis is that it depicts migrants and refugees as the cause of an imagined crisis at the border, when in fact mass displacement is the outcome of the actual crises of capitalism, conquest, and climate change. So that's why I think it's much more accurate to describe the migration crisis as actually a crisis of displacement and immobility. And I think what's even more ironic on top of that is that the migration crisis is declared a new crisis with largely Western countries positioned as its victim, even though for four centuries, Nearly 80 million Europeans became settler colonists across the Americas and Oceania, while 4 million indentured laborers from Asia were scattered across the globe and the transatlantic slave trade kidnapped and enslaved 12 million Africans. And so we see how colonialism, genocide, slavery, and indentureship are not only conveniently erased as continuities of violence in current invocations of a migration crisis, but there are also the very condition the very conditions of possibility for the West's preciously guarded imperial sovereignty, including Europe, of course. And so I think it's incredibly important um, to reframe and to understand the migration crisis as one of displacement and mobility and refuse to accept these kinds of reframings that position the state, ironically, as a victim. And I think one of the ways in which we see this is also in passive language like border deaths, right? So of course, Fortress Europe and the Mediterranean is the world's deadliest border. Um, but everywhere where there are border deaths, we use such passive language, when in fact, these are active border killings. We know that there is nothing inherently dangerous about being on the move. In fact, more people are on the move than have ever been before. And here I'm talking specifically about you know luxury travel, those of us who have access to airplanes, to visa-free access around the world. Um, but we, we don't die, right? Uh, those who are, who are dying are those who are being killed as a result of state policies of border controls, of um, drone surveillance, of interdiction and more. And so I think it's important to refuse passive language like border deaths, um, which often insidiously blames migrants for their own deaths, right? We get the kind of narrative of why, did they, why are migrants taking these dangerous journeys? Uh, we also see the really insidious focus and criminalization of smugglers and traffickers. That's the new kind of savior industrial complex is the criminalization of those who assist people in moving. 
Um, and often, of course, that is layered with extortion. Uh, but what all of that ignores is that the foundational uh, danger and precarity for migrants and refugees on the move who are facing this death scape uh, is the state, right? It's state policies um, that create these conditions of precarity, create these conditions of death, create these conditions of injury, fatality, and extortion. And so it is much more uh, accurate, I believe, uh, to turn the gaze away from those who are moving uh, and, you know, and why they move and under what conditions, I mean, why they move is important, sorry, I mean, under what conditions, why they may choose to make dangerous journeys, to shift the, way, the gaze away from the smuggling and trafficking narrative, and instead to squarely talk about the responsibility of Western states, of the EU and other formations in actively killing people at the border. So I think it is much more accurate to shift from talking about border deaths to border killings, right? These are not deaths that, have, um, that don't have uh, a perpetrator, right? It makes it seem so passive when in fact we know that there is a source of this violence that needs to be named. Uh, the next thing that I want to, to move on to, and again, I'm, I'm moving quickly, um, is how important it is to understand border regimes as beyond a line on a map. So borders are not fixed or static lines. They are productive regimes that are concurrently generated by and producing social relations of dominance. So put another way, the border is elastic, right? And that magical line can exist anywhere. It can exist within and beyond the border. Um, and within the border, we know that bordering regimes exist, for example, every time people without immigration status are picked up and turned over to, to a border enforcement, whether that's police, uh, whether that's other public services like healthcare, uh, all of these kind of bordering regimes multiply and can exist far beyond the, the border itself, the, the line on the territory, the territorial line on the map. One of the main arguments I put forward in border and rule, and of course others have argued this as well, is that the frontiers of border militarization are no longer actually around U the US or Europe or Australia, but that countries such as Libya, Mali, Mexico, Nairu, Papua New Guinea, Turkey, and Sudan have become the new frontiers of border militarization. And it is specifically the US, Australian, and European subjugation of Central America, Oceania, Africa, and the Middle East that has compelled countries in these regions to accept external checkpoints, offshore detention, migration prevention campaigns, and expelled deportees as conditions of trade and aid agreements. In Europe, we know that border externalization has been perfected and been in place since at least 1992 through the Spain-Morocco readmission agreement, which compels Morocco to readmit deportees returned from Spain. Since 2015, border externalization has become much more of a cornerstone of EU policy. And European border externalization encompasses a bundle of extraterritorial technologies and agreements that basically are aimed at preventing and deterring migrants and refugees from ever reaching European borders, right? So that looks like a slew of things, carrier sanctions on airlines, uh, Frontex expanding patrols and interceptions in the Mediterranean, Eurosur introducing drone surveillance, um, you know, countries in the EU who are intending to join the EU rather like Ukraine and Moldova, who are part of the Eastern Partnership, now have to become part of the EU's border assistance missions. And the central piece though that I would argue is that the European Commission now requires almost all development aid and trade agreements with Middle Eastern and African countries to include readmission agreements, which obligate non-European countries to preemptively control migration and readmit all expelled deportees. African countries are especially pressured to accept outsourcing of EU migration controls. We know this. We're seeing uh, perhaps the starkest example of this in what's unfolding, the horrors that have been unfolding in Libya. The Khartoum process, the Valletta summit, and the migration partnership framework lay the template for contemporary EU border outsourcing into the Sahel region. African countries are promised financial resources in exchange for reducing migration to Europe. That really is the basis of it all, right? There's a lot of technocratic language, but that really is the basis of it all. And we see also that the EU is sinking billions and billions of euros into uh, really enforcing anti-migration, anti-border enforcement, 
um, forces across the Sahel. So we have the G5 Sahel cross-border joint force that is funded and trained and the training of which is offered by the EU. The Transnational Institute has revealed how UK soldiers are training Tunisian armed forces. Italy has redeployed troops from Iraq and Afghanistan to Niger, Libya, and Tunisia. France is funding border enforcement in Tunisia and Niger. Germany is training border guards in Libya. France and Germany have border agents being trained in Mali. So there's an entire architecture of externalization and border outsourcing that has turned African countries, particularly in the Sahel region, into what Mark Ackerman calls, quote, Europe's new border guards. And I think, you know, this is incredibly important because we know that imperialism is already a root cause of global migration, right? We know this. Um, I don't have time to talk about it. I touched on it briefly. Um, but in addition to imperialism being a root cause of global migration, now increasingly the management of global migration through border outsourcing is also becoming a means of preserving imperial relations and maintaining a colonial present, right? And, you know, there are many ways to debunk the myth that we live in a post-colonial world, many ways. One of the key ways in which we can debunk that myth of a post-colonial world um, and establish that we are, in fact, squarely in a colonial present is by looking at the ways in which borders are increasingly becoming a method of imperialism, that border enforcement, the outsourcing of border enforcement is becoming a central method of maintaining imperial relations today. And so this is important for two main reasons. First, again, it emphasizes that borders are not in fact fixed lines on a map and does not passively demarcate territory. That borders are productive regimes and border controls exist far beyond the territorial line of the map itself. And again, the second reason this is important is to understand how critical immigration related diplomacy is to current global relations. We don't talk about this enough, but immigration diplomacy through the soft power of aid agreements or outright threats of war, military or trade war is compelling countries across Africa, Latin America, the Middle East and Oceania to accept outsourced migration controls, right? This is not something, you know, that countries are, are wanting to build. They're not you know, Papua New Guinea and Nairu um, have been compelled to build Australian offshore detention because their trade and aid with Australia is dependent on it, right? So uh, the, the ways in which imperial dependency and imperial exploitation is increasingly cemented through migration controls is so crucial to understand because, again, it cements imperial relations and also then globalizes the racial violence of detention, right? So we know, for example, increasingly the rates of border death um, are, are increasingly higher trying to cross the Mediterranean, not at the site of the Mediterranean itself, but increasingly how precarious and dangerous it is um, for African migrants to cross through North Africa and the Sahel region, right? That the rates of death as a result of the globalization of the racial violence of immigration detention means the borders are multiplying everywhere and the danger and the, the deathscape is literally everywhere. Um, and again, this is so important because border outsourcing as a method of migration management and also of imperialism in our contemporary era um, is not talked about enough, but I think is so central and needs to be squarely located in our analysis of borders. The next thing that I wanted uh, to talk about is migration and racial capitalism. And in addition to borders being a central pillar of imperialism, borders are also a central pillar of racial capitalism. And growing international talk of quote, managed migration and a concerted shift towards quote, temporary labor migration in high income countries really proves this point. Um, so temporary labor migration, briefly, for those who are unfamiliar, takes many forms in many different countries and jurisdictions, but kind of the, the fundamental aspect of it is that it legally ties immigration status to employment. So it effectively turns um, immigrant workers into migrant workers who are 
in a pool of unfree indentured work, right? So this is not about a bad employer or a single bad employer. This is a state sanctioned legalized program of indentureship, essentially. What the state does is to differentiate these workers as migrant workers, right? And migrant workers is really a euphemism for so-called third world workers whose labor power is captured by the border first and then manipulated and exploited by the employer. And while migrant workers are often temporary, so again, their immigration status is tied to employment, um, so when their employment is no longer needed, they are deported, they are expelled, they may return in future years, but again, it's contingent on employment, right? So there's no permanent residency. So while, this, while migrant workers may be temporary, temporary migration is increasingly permanent and becoming a modality central to state formation, citizenship regulation, labor segmentation with the national labor markets and segregated social ordering. And increasingly, it's also the liberal, or I should say neoliberal response to outright um, white supremacist exclusionary rhetoric, right? So one of the ways, as I mentioned earlier, that the liberal kind of liberal centrists respond to overt right wing racism is this kind of charity refugee welcomes response. Another response is actually to rely on temporary labor migration, right? So a lot of liberal capitalist interests are invested in temporary labor migration. And the argument goes, you know, oh, look, the right wants to shut down the border. We don't want to shut down the border. We want to welcome migrants and refugees, but we want to welcome them based on these, this model of temporary labor migration. Um, and in response to that, so we have the right wing response, we have the liberal centrist capitalist response. And then we also have a response that's unfortunately growing on the left today. And these kinds of left progressive responses is to reanimate the working class along nationalist lines. And we hear this in refrains like, you know, we need to take care of ourselves before others, or refrains like foreign workers are driving down wages, and calls on citizens to protect our jobs, quote unquote, from migrants, not only presupposes that migrants are not also part of the working class, but it actively pits workers against each other, right? We have to remember that migrant workers don't suppress wages, bosses and borders do. We also have to remember that our enemy arrives in a limousine, not on a boat. And this kind of leftist nationalism really is a reactionary ruling class nationalism. And it's one that we must reject. The demand for increased enforcement against migrant workers maintains the international division of labor upon which capitalism relies and aligns with far right racism to blunt class consciousness. The only way to fight back against the cheapening of labor through, for example, undocumented and migrant worker programs is to actually fight against racism and to fight for immigration status and labor protection and living wages for all workers to basically make the divisions created by the border obsolete. These kinds of nationalist calls also fail to recognize that tightening the border cannot work against globalized capital because the border is itself a method for capital. Labor unions and leftists who believe stronger borders can protect us against capitalism misrecognize the role of the state and capital. Free capital requires immobilized, immobilized labor that the border produces. Insourced labor from labor migration programs are basically the flip side of outsourced labor in free trade zones. This is a segmentation of the global labor force made precarious through bordering practices. And so this is so important to recognize because again, migration is increasingly a pillar of racial capitalism and how we fight capitalism cannot be through borders, because again, borders are a method of capitalism. So dismantling and abolishing borders is an inherently necessary part of dismantling racial citizenship and dismantling racial capitalism. I want to end um, by talking about this vision, right, about talking about this vision for a world without borders. I want to start my conclusion by saying that I believe in no borders. And no borders is a distinct politic from open borders, right? Open borders is a politics where the world is as we know it, and we open our borders to migrants and refugees. But I think a no borders politics is more expansive because it refuses to accept 
that the so-called global north and the so-called global south will continue to exist. It refuses the system of global apartheid that suggests that the global south will continue to be exploited and extracted uh, for the benefit of the global north. So the global, the kinds of arguments that we often hear against an open border politics, right, which is like a brain drain, or that there'll be an asymmetry of movement towards the global north, presupposes that all of the other social conditions of the world are just, except for the border. Um, however, a no border politics is fundamentally tied up to a practice and a politics and an ethical orientation that dismantles all sources of violence um, that argues that just as important as it is for, free, for people to have the freedom to move, it is just as important for people to have the freedom to stay, right? Which is that people should not be forcibly displaced from their homes. Um, and in that way, I think the freedom to stay and the freedom to move are not contradictory. They are necessary corollaries to imagine and build this world that Eduardo Galeano talks about, right? One where there is a home for everyone. So that means that we fight for the people, we fight for the rights or the freedom for people to move in order to seek safety and dignity. And we also fight to ensure that people are not forcibly displaced from their homes, that we fight against all of the violent extractions that exist around the world today. So that means that we are also fighting against are fighting against gentrification. We're fighting against forced displacement. We are fighting for the abolition of prisons. We must also fight to end wars and militarization. We must also fight to end the extractions of racial capitalism. These are all interconnected visions and part and parcel of a no border politics. And it also means that we squarely refuse, we squarely refuse divisions between those who are deserving and undeserving, right? The rhetoric of productive and legal and good immigrants with the simultaneous demonization of bad or criminal or illegal immigrants really maintains these structural violences. And innocence, this politics of innocence where people have to constantly, uh, and oppressed people have to constantly justify and produce um, our, their humanity um, is actually fundamentally dehumanizing, right? Ruth Wilson Gilmore reminds us that our political task is not to prove innocence against state violence, but to quote, attack the general system through which criminalization proceeds. And so I think it is so important that, um, so, that such a big part of a no border politics is refusing the politics of innocence, refusing the politics of respectability, and also seeing how our struggles are inherently connected. Um, and I want to end with the words of Eduardo Galeano again. And Eduardo Galeano, you know, he's just the source of so much inspiration. He used to say, quote, indignation must always be the answer to indignity. Reality is not destiny. I'm gonna say that again. Indignation must always be the answer to indignity. Reality is not destiny. And in that way, prisons, borders, sweatshops, pipelines, gentrification, drone warfare are all interrelated systems of exploitation and control. And we must fight all of these systems together. And we must orient ourselves towards freedom, true freedom, freedom where everyone has a home because our lives and the future of the planet depends on it. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for such a wonderful keynote. And our q and is buzzing with a lot of questions. And so I'm just going to get right in. Um, so earlier today, you tweeted about um, needing more people in the non industrial or the nonprofit industrial complex to refuse to maintain status quo politics. And a few of the questions we got in the Q&A um, surround this. And also, I think, you know, like we're here at Oxford Uni and we're hosting this conference and this university is built on racial capitalism and you know, the bounty of colonialism. And so I think the first question is how and under what conditions might we hold ourselves within these institutions and actors structurally accountable for the violence that they're complicit in, in bordering practices? Oh, it's a good question. Um, and hard for me to say exactly, because I think each place, you know, uh, has its own terrain of struggle. 
Uh, but I'd say maybe in a general way, particularly for those who are located um, in universities, maybe three quick things. One is, you know, find out what are your policies at the university level as it relates to migrants and, and refugees and undocumented people. Um, what are the layers of exploitation? Sometimes it's a matter of lack of access that people can't register um, if they're undocumented or, you know, international student fees increasingly one of the primary forms of extraction in post-secondary education, right? So um, really just hone down on those specific ways um, in which that extraction and exploitation is happening. Uh, the second is to really look at um, some of the agreements that universities have uh, with some of, you know, with war profiteers and with profiteers in the border industrial complex. Demand that your university break ties uh, with those corporate profiteers or, you know, any other kind of extractive agreements with fossil fuels, with arms trade dealers, etc. Because again, this is about a global politics, right? Um, this isn't only, you know, supporting migrants and refugees is inherently, if we see, if we understand migration is a politics of reparation for global imperialism, it means that we have to understand that work to support migrants and refugees is inherently internationalist and requires that response. Um, so that's, I think, the second thing. Um, the third is, I think, you know, depending on who we are, um, those intimate relations of care are also incredibly important. You know, we're in a time of global vaccine apartheid. And that means that for everybody, and particularly for educators, it requires a lot of care um, for our students, right? For our students about what they're going through. Um, and to understand that there's a real massive cognitive dissonance that some of us live in countries where we can access vac vaccines relatively quickly and safely now while the rest of the world is being denied that, right? Again, because not because of something um, that is, you know, relies on the tropes of the backwardness of the global South, but because of active policies, imperialism um, and the World Trade Organization. And so I think it requires care and solidarity to be part of the struggle um, and to understand that people are facing this vaccine apartheid in real time, right? Like we're experiencing this in real time and we have to be part of that fight. So the next question comes from me and it builds on the second point you made about thinking of like the ability to move as sort of a reparations. So other scholars like uh, Dr. Itendai Chume um, put forth like migration as decolonization and make a different argument about it, framed slightly different about like political inclusion. And so I'm wondering if like thinking about migration as sort of a reparations could like augment that because I think that like both of your arguments draw from the same thinkers, like Adam gets to choose work on like third world internationalisms. So do you see like any bridges between those two frameworks? Yeah, I think so. And that's a, a meaty question. Um, you know, I could say I, I tackle some of that more in the book. It's hard to talk about briefly, um, but I think so. And, you know, I think fundamentally for me, it's to understand our contemporary moment in the scope of both the world Right, we need to place this in the symmetries and the asymmetries, more importantly, of global relations and global power. Um, and also, we need to understand our contemporary moment in a historic arc. Um, and I think, you know, there are many uh, thinkers thinking through decolonial internationalist frameworks from many perspectives. But I think what's shared is really that fundamental analysis. Um, I think what the reason that I highlight highlighted a lot is because I think particularly in the in work around borders, we don't often see that analysis put forward, right? We see it put forward um, in critical race theory. We see it put forward in, um, you know, black Marxism and the black radical tradition. We see it put forward in, uh, you know, critiques of post-colonialism and anti-imperialism. But I think a lot of uh, work around and scholarship around particularly scholarship around borders, especially in the European context, really focuses on the symbol of the border without locating it in imperial policies um, and without locating it in historic policies. And I'm making a vast generalization here. There's amazing work that is being done. And of course the work around the black Mediterranean being central to that. Um, but in general, I think the spectacle of the border as a kind of non-racist technology, I think has really been uh, a flaw of a lot of uh, work around bordering practices. 
so to build on that, we got a really great question. Um, so, so someone asked, so to imagine borders as anti-Indigenous and anti-Black can also be seen as a very North American and Eurocentric stance that assumes unidirectional mobility from the so-called third world to the, the so-called first world. And so this person wants to know if like, if we make sense of universally open borders or um, like border abolition, might this leave um, those who undertake South-South migration um, a little bit more precarious? Yeah, I mean, I think South-South migration also highlights those same tendencies, right? If we look at the kafala system, um, if we look at the kafala system in the context of um, the ways in which the kafala, you know, the Gulf cooperation countries in the South are one of the primary um, regions of South-South migration, right? Um, and it is undeniable that the GCC uh, has an exploited a system of kafala that overwhelmingly exploits and extracts the labor um, of those from Ethiopia, Eritrea, Nepal, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and, you know, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, and more. And those are exploitative relations. So um, I think for sure, a lot of what I talk about is um, in the context of uh, South to North, but I think it's increasingly the case in South to South migrations, uh, especially if you look at domestic work, a lot increasingly the chains of domestic work implicate countries in the South. And also the South is not a homogenous region either, right? We know that in the context of the South, they are, there are geopolitical imperial interests. Uh, you know, India's an imperial power, um, for example, and that, you know, we can look at that in other regions as well. And so I think in that way, uh, we see the same kinds of extractions across uh, race, class, caste, and more. Um, and when it comes to, uh, you know, the question of borders as a technology, I think there's another part to that question there. Can borders protect against mobility? Um, for example, Kashmir, Assam, or indigenous communities were skeptical of external mobility. Um, in that sense, actually, you know, the framework of indigeneity is not North American, it's global. Um, because then we can extend, you know, that same example, right? Indigenous communities in North America or Kashmir or Palestine and elsewhere. Um, but what I would suggest here is that there is a, there is a difference. There is a difference between um, people migrating and there's a difference between settler colonialism, right? Like those are distinct processes. Um, and absolutely, you know, settler colonization is a tactic of colonization, but to, to conflate and assume that settler colonialism is the same as what we're talking about migration in the world today, or that borders will fix that, um, I think requires us to, to really question that, right? And I'll offer an example. Um, you know, again, it is a North American example, but uh, I think the analogies to some degree hold, which is that, you know, the Wet'suwet'en nation, an indigenous nation uh, here where I live, um, you know, they have, when you enter their territory, you're asked a number of questions, right? You're asked, do you have, they're exercising their free prior and informed consent, right? As in the face of colonialism. And they ask you, what is your purpose? Why are you here? Um, how are you going to benefit our community? Are you part of government or industry in any way? And so in a simplistic way, that might seem like a border checkpoint, right? Like you're, you're being controlled from accessing territory, but it's not because communities exercising accountability and reciprocity is not a border in the same way that, you know, the ways in which communities are refusing prisons and building alternative models of community accountability, right? Those are not carceral, right? So all forms of accountability cannot be presumed to be the same as state institutions that are inherently violent. And so um, I think it's important to differentiate uh, between say prisons and community accountability, like not holding people accountable is not the same thing as a prison. And in the same way, you know, people, um, talking about or, or ensuring that their community is not being overrun by settler colonists is not the same as a state border. I think those are different technologies. Um, and it's in, it, we cannot separate out the border from imperialism and state violence, which is again, I think it's important, not just about the act of the border, right? It's not about the symbolism of a border. It's about an understanding how bound up it is. Uh, in state and imperial and capitalist violence. It is a technology of state control. And it's not simply the act of throwing up a checkpoint to protect your people. Those are distinct things. So next question is um, about community accountability and responsibility. And um, 
I've been thinking a lot about like anti-Asian hate crimes and the way that like different communities have different goals. And I think as someone who's trying to be constantly like a better abolitionist and been having a lot of deep conversations about abolition, the difference between like total abolition of like borders and like policing and thinking about like more strategic transitional goals, like in a more operational activist mindset. Um, do you separate between like transitional goals and like total goals when you're theorizing or in your um, like practitioner work and your community work? And I guess if you had transitional goals, like what would those be like steps towards border abolition or abolition of other really cruel systems? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot and it really depends on the context where people are at. Um, but for me, you know, a guiding principle is the guiding principle by critical resistance and the Black Panther Party who talk about non reformist reforms and to differentiate between those kinds of steps um, that lead us towards our goal of abolition of police, prisons, you know, borders, military industrial complex, and more. And those, you know, that, um, that take us a step back, right? So there are certain kinds of reforms that entrench the status quo. And there are certain kinds of reforms that increase the possibility and space for freedom. Um, and I can't really suggest what each of those look like. It looks different in each context, but I think that's a, a guiding principle that can help us along the way. Um, I can say that in the context that I'm in, for example, what that has meant is refusing divisions between good and bad immigrants, right? So the no one is legal movement that I've been part of we advocated for status for all people with no exclusions, like none of those kinds of exclusions that reproduce ideas of desirability, um, that also critically refuse exclusions based on you know, criminality, for example, or participation in the wage economy. We know that participation in the wage economy is a deeply you know, ableist idea um, and really um, harms people who are working and laboring um, but not in the capitalist way, right? So generative forms of labor are often excluded from these programs. Um, so that's one concrete way is refusing those kinds of divisions is a kind of reformist reform to refuse. Um, whereas, you know, a non-reformist reform is, uh, you know, freeing people from detention, right? Like fighting deportations and detentions uh, individually or in a community level uh, while achieving or, you know, while working to attain a world uh, without borders and police and prisons. Like that's just one small example. I think next question will be about um, sovereignty. So I think when we're talking about like border abolition, some scholars um, take like a pretty hyper-local approach to sovereignty. And I think your point about how like indigenous communities think are thinking globally and a lot of these communities and a lot of these really inclusive ideologies are thinking largely, how do you think we can reconcile like local sovereignties with like more, more global internationalisms in theory and in practice. Sorry, you cut out a little bit. This, what's the last part? How do we reconcile um, like local sovereignties with more global internationalism striving towards the same goals? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of what we're dealing with is the crisis of our imagination, right? <laughs> like we are in a world that is thoroughly, thoroughly ingrained uh, with capitalist, colonial, gendered, ableist, you know, sexualized ideas and more. And I can't overstate this enough because it means that um, so much of this work is the work of our political imagination. And so much of this work is unearthing um, what is happening around the world. I think it's a fair critique that, you know, uh, a lot of border work um, really focuses on locations like North America or Europe, Australia. But again, a lot of bordering practices and you know, thinking through exercise of sovereignty is happening around the world. Um, but I, I really take my inspiration from movements. <laughs> like again, I'm not as much a theorist at all. Uh, I happen to write two books really coincidentally. Um, I don't have a background in, in, in research or any of this in academia. Uh, so it comes from movement, right? And in, in the movement context, um, I think there's a lot to learn where people are growing and expanding and exercising sovereignty and solidarity in different ways, where, for example, you know, uh, Zapatista communities who have been teaching us since 1994 and before, but particularly since 1994, when the Easy land first rose up in armed rebellion, um, you know, against global capitalism, against colonialism as an indigenous community fighting for 500 plus years. And through their work, 
um, we're, are both building local autonomy um, and building and exercising sovereignty, you know, and governance in a way that is uh, democratic. Um, and, you know, really based in, the, in these participatory models of democracy, while at the same time having an internationalist lens to the world, right? Like, and the Zapatistas are just one example, but the, the Zapatistas as like, you know, uh, the model in the global justice movements for decades while expressing solidarity with Palestine, while expressing solidarity with labor movements. Um, so I think those are some examples that we really need to that we really need to focus on. For me, it's less of the theorizing around sovereignty, but looking at the actual everyday exercise of sovereignty and solidarity um, that's happening, right? Or the solidarity that's been expressed over the years by Palestinians uh, to African migrants who are incarcerated in Israel, right? Um, those are some of the ways in which, again, we see that uh, borders, you know, may seem that it, it may seem contradictory to have a movement for indigenous autonomy while having free movement. But the reality is, is these kinds of solidarities are expressed in real time all the time. And I don't wanna romanticize that because I know there's often also um, these kinds of uh, nationalisms that can be harmful. Uh, but in general, I think, you know, people who are oppressed often do have an understanding of oppression around the world, right? It's not about theorizing through it or making clean arguments, it's the praxis it's the process of struggle where I think a lot of this has worked out. Um, so next question. So in the introduction of your book, um, I think like your, your critique of like a hollow multiculturalism that a lot of like liberal centrists use and speak of like the other person as like a stranger or as someone as like a bearer of difference. I think right now, as we talk about like anti-blackness and racism put that at the forefront, um, I was curious about how you think we should relate to the other, because I guess like some would say that the opposite of that would be like the other bad thing, which is like liberal colorblindness where we don't see color. So how do you think we can ethically engage and acknowledge difference and build across and beyond it with dignity and respect to all? Yeah. Oh, am I on mute or can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Sorry, I thought I was on mute. <laughs> um, I think that's a great question. And I think you, you pose, you know, some of the, the key kind of failures of that response, right? Which is um, the kind of liberal response is that then you don't see color. I think, again, you know, a lot of that comes through the practice of struggle, right? Like it's the practice of trying to figure out how to be in ethical relationships with one another um, and to build uh, to build together in a way that does not um, pretend that difference doesn't occur, like not this kind of, you know, we are the 99% against the 1% that is very reductionist, um, but to build uh, through difference and across difference in a way that is genuinely multiracial, right? That understands that we have social positions in the world and also that social positions in the world are always contextual and are always malleable, right? That they are built. Um, and part of understanding, for example, um, that race is a construct, but racism is real, means that we're constantly building and forging new identities and new alliances. And those have to come in the, pro in the context of an actual alliance and relationship, right? It can't be, it can't be imagined in abstract. Um, but one of the things about the question about strangers that I think Sarah Ahmed responds to really well, right, which is that, you know, um, when Sarah Ahmed writes that, quote, strangers are not simply those who we do not recognize, but those who we recognize as strangers, right? And so we understand here that multiculturalism um, is intended not to be a counter to, but really is uh, a foundation for how racism continues to operate. And I think the ways in which we dismantle the racial social organization of difference is through shared solidarities, is through shared struggle. Um, we can look to a lot of beautiful histories in different contexts about you know, people coming together in order to be in struggle. We see it right now in black led abolition movements that are, that are multiracial, um, that have leadership in black communities but are fighting police and prisons in a multiracial, uh, in multiracial formations. And so I think we um, organize against the idea of uh, strangers by first recognizing it, by not assuming it doesn't exist. 
And secondly, by organizing in ways to dismantle it um, rather than to reinforce it. So last question before I hand it back to Bala and Sarah. So one of the most inspiring passages of your book in closing is um, that a no borders politics then is a politics of refusal, a politics of revolution and a politics of repair. Revolutions stretch our imaginations and manifest our desires. Political struggle is a politics and a practice. Um, what do you think, you know, all of us, like a lot of us are students or academics or scholars working in this space. Um, how do you think we can go forward with some of these amazing ideas and commitments in mind in our everyday lives to cultivate, you know, more just worlds and to undo, you know, like the rule of border and border imperialism in our everyday lives? Oh, good question. You know, I have to say that I know it can be overwhelming to think about how insurmountable and perhaps utopic a vision that is, right? Like, um, it may seem insurmountable to have a world without borders uh, because we live in, you know, the reality is we live in such a fragmented world, right? We live in a world that is completely underwritten by violence, where our connections to other people in the world outside of our family or kinship networks are completely extractive, right? Like most of, most of how we live in relationship to the rest of the world is extractive. It's either bound up in uh, exploitative trade, um, in exploitative you know, relations of manufacturing where you know, our clothes are produced by other people in other places in the world and we have no relationship to those people. Um, you know, or we consume in unethical ways that harms the earth and harms other people. Um, so I know it's insurmountable, but I'd have to say for myself, um, I really found it less overwhelming to focus on the individual um, and individual actions I could take because, you know, when I was younger and I was, you know, trying to save the planet and I was recycling and nothing changed, I found it very demobilizing, right? And that's the thing, individual actions will not change anything. That's the unfortunate reality. The nature of the world is such that even, you know, revolutionary organizing and activism is commodified where people think we can be individual social change makers. Unfortunately, we can't. Of course, there are changes we can do individually, but the reality is the scale of change that is needed requires all of us, right? We all have a role to play. We just need to find what our gifts are, our skill set is, and join with other people in order to make that happen. And the other thing is it can seem overwhelming because we care about one issue, right? We can't, we feel like we can't care about all issues. So that can seem overwhelming. Um, but again, for me, I actually found it uh, a little bit less overwhelming when I was like, oh, everything is connected. Like in one way, it's one big ball, right? It's not actually 10 balls. It's one big fucking knot. Oh, sorry for swearing. Um, so in some ways, you know, when you work on one thing, you unravel it all. Uh, so I, I, maybe I'm not answering this question, but I hope what I can offer is a bit of a paradigm shift, which is that seeing that things are connected and realizing the issue is bigger than us may seem overwhelming, but in some ways it's less overwhelming because, um, you know, it, it motivates us to join with other people to affect change. It motivates us to see the interconnections between issues that we thought we didn't know or care about, but to realize that these are fundamentally connected. You know, if we care about the climate, you have to care about borders. <laughs> climate displacement is increasingly the face of climate change, right? So um, we see the ways in which these are, are connected. So I, um, I don't think there's anything that we can do individually that doesn't involve other people. So I'm, I'm ready to build our own Zoom internationalism with the other couple hundred people on this, on this panel and this keynote. And um, yeah, I mean, this has been a really illuminating um, keynote address. And thank you so much for your responses to, to all of the many questions. Um, could keep you here all evening. And I'm sure people would love to listen to you, but we've got a world to win. So I'm gonna hand it back to Isabella and Sarah for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for attending. I have the honor of concluding this incredible keynote speech. So first of all, thank you so much, Hasher. Thank you, Trin, for moderating. I think this has been a really powerful, inspiring, and I must say, moving keynote address.
And I have so many notes um, all over the place. I don't know what I should highlight now at the end, but I'm really glad because I think the debates that we had and also the discussion and all the questions really speak to what we wanted to do with the conference and to the panels that will be upcoming in, in the coming week. And I really hope that we will just continue this free, these fruitful debates uh, in the coming weeks. And I'm so glad that you've highlighted the importance of historicizing um, state policies of border control, that you've highlighted how the so-called global mobility regime is really a forced immobility regime and that you've also highlighted the anti-blackness of the current border regime and how all our structures struggles are actually interconnected and i think something that is really important for a conference is that you've spoken so much especially at the beginning about representation because uh, obviously also our conference deals with a lot of representation i think it's so important that in our scholarship in our activism um, we choose the right words like as you say that we highlight it's really border killings and I just can just say, I hope we will continue these debates in the following days. And thank you so much. And I would also like to thank the co-hosts of this conference, Routed Magazine, Border Criminologies, and the Oxford Migration and Mobility Network. And if you've not already had a look, the conference special issue is also available on the Routed website with contributions from many of our panelists, short articles, creative submissions, and videos. And you can find a link to the special issue in all the emails that we've recently sent out, as well as on our social media pages. And just a reminder, um, the recordings and also this keynote will be published on the Border Criminologies YouTube account shortly after the event. Um, so we can all go back to this keynote and listen to it again, which will be great. And then just a small ask, uh, if you can, and if you're enjoying the conference so far, please consider making a donation, which can be done through purchasing a donation ticket on our Eventbrite page. And the donations are not going to us, they're actually going to five great organizations that are each contributing to the conference week, namely Otros Dreams in Action, State Watch, Oxford Against Immigration Detention, and Border Violence Monitoring Networks, and Art Connects. So we would be really grateful if you consider making a small donation um, on their behalf. And you'll be also able to engage with these organizations in the coming days, but I'll leave it to Bella now for introducing what is left to come. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I just wanted to echo that thank you to Harsha and Trin. Um, Harsha, um, your work has really shaped how I've approached this degree and many of us have approached this degree and discussed it and inform how to live a politic of abolition more expansively and to be in community. And thank you for sharing your time and steps to move forward on entangling this massive knot. Um, and I can't wait to rewatch this on YouTube immediately, um, but incredibly informative on so many fronts. Thank you. And I'm really thrilled to have these discussions advanced, especially here. Um, and do be sure to follow up on social media for information on the rest of the conference week. We hope you'll be virtually joining us soon. You can still register for all upcoming events on Eventbrite and the Zoom link is the same for the entire week. We have two panels coming up tomorrow, detention, encampment and deportation at 11 a.m. BST, which very explicitly speaks to the carcerality of border management and the activist practitioner panel tomorrow at 5 p.m., which will feature aforementioned organizations and activist collectives. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you all there. Take care and thanks again. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, great job, you too. Um, okay, I'm gonna end the meeting now, and I guess that's it. You think? Okay, well done. Bye, everybody. Thanks for attending and hanging around. <laughs> you know, uh, we have to go dismantle all these bad things together <laughs> in communion. <laughs> Bye.